Okay. So first of all, uh, welcome everyone to our first uh, Digigenomics uh, uh, seminar during the winter term. And uh, today we will start with a presentation by one of our internal speakers, uh, namely uh, Daniel Metko, and he will talk about machine learning in stock return prediction. I think this is a very timely topic a lot of people are working on currently all around the world. Uh, I think also today we have a couple of uh, people attending from uh, outside our group, even from uh, foreign universities. And uh, so we're all very much looking forward uh, to your presentation and the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name, as, as you already mentioned, is uh, Daniel and I'm new to the Digenomics group as of October 1st. In my presentation today, I would like to talk about machine learning and in specific, uh, specifically in the context of stock return prediction. More specifically, um, I am pleased to present a paper written in, in collaboration with Christian Fieberg, Thorsten Pottich and uh, Thomas Loy. Um, we finished our paper last month and uh, already submitted it to the European Journal of Operation and Research. Um, but before I start with the paper itself, I would pretty much uh, like to give a brief introduction of our research group and uh, what we do. Um, yeah, after that, I will pretty much go through our paper section by section and um, summarize or sum up the core uh, elements and, and results we came up with. Um, our research topic, as you can see on the slide, is artificial in, in intelligence and accounting and finance. And members of our group are Thomas Loy, Christian Fieberg, me, and apparently until now we have one spare vacancy. Um, in our research, we apply machine learning methods to uh, problems or, or general problems in, in finance and accounting. Um, that provide sufficient data in order to use these kinds of algorithms. Um, and the reason behind that is quite straightforward. Um, in financial data, it is very reasonable to assume nonlinearities. And under these conditions, linear or parametric approaches, which are commonly applied in, in this kind of research, might only give a vague approximation of the true com complexity in capital markets. And the growing availability of data and as well computational resources pretty much um, supports the use of those more costly algorithms. Now let's step over to, to the working paper. The motivation um, behind our idea is that the prediction of stock returns is a very fundamental one, a, a topic in finance. And also machine learning is um, not new at all with early studies reaching back to the 1990s. Um, however, those studies, especially in the context of return prediction, um, found rather moderate success. And um, in the meantime, so from the 1990s until most recently, uh, the availability in data and computational resources, this is what I have mentioned um, earlier, have grown dramatically and thereby providing a way better playing field for machine learning algorithms in general than back in the 1990s. So, and along that way, the interest in machine learning has started growing again. And recent papers uh, show very promising results, like as for example, Krauss et al. to, to 17, Fischer and Krauss to 18, and Gu et al. to 20. Uh, which are all in the context uh, of stock return prediction, but um, also in, in other areas of uh, financial and accounting. Um, for an overview, you can uh, 
look at Rundo et al. 2019, who basically provide a survey of several financial applications of machine learning algorithms. Um, however, referring back to Kraus et al., Fischer and Kraus and Hu et al., those studies pretty much um, yeah, lack a fair comparison um, by not applying the current state-of-the-art approach in stock return prediction, which mo was motivated by Levelin in 2050. And without this comparison, we cannot really uh, judge whether there is a value added by machine learning or not. So they are pretty much in, in free space. <clears throat> and by saying that, the contribution of our paper is uh, fivefold. First, we provide a fair comparison of parametric and machine learning methods by, as, as mentioned before, applying the current state of the art linear approach and also supplying all models with the exact same amount of data. This is also not the case for. Um, all studies that I mentioned previously. Second, we establish a, a particularly hard setting for machine learning models by using only a pretty small set of variables, which we derive from prominent linear market models. Therefore, it is to assume that uh, those variables are very likely to have a strong linear impact and are uh, favored by the linear model. Um, third, we examine the role of firm size in terms of market capitalization and stock return predictability. This uh, provides valuable insights on the practical benefits because small firms are, if any, very difficult and costly to trade on the real market. And lastly, oh, not lastly, uh, fourth, we use forecast combinations because um, yeah, in the literature, especially by a study of Timmerman, they have been found to produce um, better forecasts on average and at the same time reduce individual model risk and thereby acting like a sort of um, diversification tool. And yeah, finally, lastly, we contribute to the reduction of the the U.S. bias in empirical capital market research. Um, Caroli, 2016, found that only 16% of uh, empirical studies in top journals examine uh, non-U.S. markets. But, but the last point is um, a rather minor one. The data sample in, in our study contain stocks from all countries of the MSCI Developed Markets Europe Index, which are 15 countries in total and totaling 12,000 stocks in the cross-section. Our sample reaches from uh, January 1990 to December 2019, so totaling 30 years of uh, monthly data, of course. And the dependent variable in our setting is the risk green room, which we calculate as return minus risk free rate. And we use the risk premium because um, theoretically speaking, this is the only part of the return that is priced on the market. Um, yeah, in terms of, of the independent variables, as mentioned earlier, and also in order to um, establish a particularly hard setting for machine learning, um, our independent variables are derived from prominent capital market models, such as the Pharma French three-factor model, Pharma French five-factor model, as well as um, the CAR four-factor model. And those, those variables are market capitalization in terms of the market value, momentum 12 months, which is the momentum, uh, the total return over the prior 12 months, Months, excluding the last months because of a short term reversal, which is present in stock markets. Then we have the book equity to market equity ratio, investments 
which is gross and total assets, operating profitability, which is operating income to book equity. And finally, finally we have the uh, market beta from the capital asset pricing model, which is pretty much the exposure um, to the market. Um, now let, let, let's finally come to the part of machine learning. In general, we, we have a regression pro problem where we model the future risk premium as defined earlier, uh, which is our, um, the return for company I at time T plus one as a function G of some independent variable X. And in, in our empirical study, G can take various forms, such as the linear approach, which I mentioned earlier, which we use for benchmarking purposes. Then we have support vector machines, random forest and gradient boosted trees, as well as neural networks, where the bold letters in parentheses uh, indicate the labels, which, which I will use. Uh, later on the slides. Um, I don't want to go into much detail of the models because I guess it's probably way beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, but one, one thing is worth noting um, that the linear model is obviously only able to capture linear effects and dependencies while the, the four other models are all able to capture high degree nonlinearity. And that's pretty much uh, one main benefit of machine learning algorithms, that then they can fit any function. Um, moreover, I talked about model combination. And in, that, in, in this setting, we model the future return as the the average prediction over several models, where in this um, equation, H um, denotes the number of models to be combined. And more specifically, we consider four different types of combinations. First, we create pairwise combinations of, of the linear model plus each individual, uh, individual machine learning model. Second, we create an ensemble um, of only machine learning algorithms. Third, we combine all models, which means that we also combine uh, or, or include the linear model. And lastly, uh, we assign equal weight to the linear model and the ensemble of only machine learning models from bullet point two. And the idea behind combinations two to, five, uh, two to four is that we increase the contribution of the linear model from 0% in bullet point two, over 20% in bullet point three, and finally up to 50% uh, linear impact and 50% machine learning impact in bullet point four. And this will hopefully give us an indication of whether the linear model is um, actually beneficial or not in, in terms of uh, um, generating predictions. Mm, in terms of estimation, we follow Level by using a 10 year rolling window, which is obviously equal to one, 120 months, because we use monthly data. And our models are fit only on the full cross-section of stock, stocks, which is uh, relevant later when we come to the firm size. Um, unlike the linear model, machine learning models have some additional uh, parameters called hyperparameters that pretty much control the smoothness of the fit of the model and thereby um, also how well they generalize to new data. Um, and therefore, it is necessary or yeah, crucial to take an additional step and optimize those uh, hyperparameters 
adaptively from the training set. And in, in uh, our study, we do this by performing a grid search, which is implemented by pretty much splitting every rolling 10 year window into seven years of training and three years of validation. Then we take a specific set of hyperparameters from the predefined grid, fit our machine learning model, evaluate its performance on the three years of validation data. And after iterating over all points from the predefined grid, we pick the set of hyperparameters that perform best and finally re-estimate the model on the full 10-year um, range of data. <clears throat> Sorry. On the next slide, I will give yeah, more of a graphical representation of what this process looks like. And as mentioned um, earlier, um, for both models, we have the full sample range of 30 years. And for the linear model, we simply fit our beta coefficients to um, yeah, 10 years of training data, which is uh, highlighted in green and create 12 months ahead predictions, uh, which is highlighted in red here. After doing that, we step one year forward as shown uh, at, at uh, row t equals two and iterate this process until we reach uh, the end of our out of sample period. For machine learning models, we have this additional blue area which is still in sample, but we need in order to choose the optimal set of hyperparameters. And once we have our set of hyperparameters, we refit our model on this amount of data. So by that, we, what I mentioned earlier, we provide both kinds of algorithms with the exact same amount of data in general. <clears throat> Yeah, in, in terms of evaluation, we have pretty much three different criteria in which we evaluate model performance. First is statistical performance, second is economic performance, and third is uh, the robustness. And the statistical performance is uh, assessed by, by using a pseudo R-square, which is um, very, very common in the context of return prediction or model comparison, where we compare the mean squared error of our respective model to, which is uh, shown in, in um, the numerator, to the mean squared error of a constant model, which is written in the denominator. And unlike the conventional R-square, it is uh, noteworthy that this value, uh, this R-square can in fact take uh, negative values, which indicate that the respective model is worse than a constant model. <clears throat> Secondly, we have the, the, the economic performance, which we evaluate by portfolio sorts. This is pretty much a standard approach in the related literature. And we do this by assigning all stocks into one of 10 portfolios using a decile breakpoint of the predicted returns and then calculate the return, the realized returns of the assigned portfolios. This process is iterated for every month in the out of sample period. And the difference between the top and bottom portfolio, which we denote as high minus low, gives an indication of how well a model is able to capture the cross-sectional dispersion in returns, and thereby gives us um, yeah, a neat measure to uh, compare models in their predictive ability. And lastly, our third evaluation tool is related to the role of firm size. Um, 
to the robustness of our models by considering different uh, levels of market liquidity. And we carry this out by dropping predictions for stocks with prior market, uh, prior months market capitalization below a certain threshold Q, where Q in our uh, case corresponds to, to deciles of cross-sectional market capitaliz capitalization. And this is what I mentioned earlier. We don't refit our models. We simply drop the predictions for lower levels of market liquidity. And then we, of course, reevaluate the performance on, on this reduced set of predictions. But now after talking uh, about data models and evaluation, um, I am finally pleased to present you um, our results. Um, but before going into too much detail, I would like to give a short introduction on the table structure because this will repeat several times in, in, in course of uh, the result section. And in the first section, um, in the first column, you can see the drop-off thresholds, which I mentioned previously, um, indicating that each row corresponds to an increasingly liquid market. So the first row with a Q of zero covers, corresponds to the full cross section, um, while um, the last row corresponds to, to, to a reduced section of only the 10% largest stocks. Um, yeah, and everything in between, obviously. And the column headers denote the um, model labels, which I also mentioned earlier. And if we now look at a specific value in our table, for example, 0 0.35, this means that random forest has a R square of 0.35% for the 70% largest stocks, or in other words, that if we drop the 30% Oh, 70%, sorry. Or in other words, if we drop the lowest or the smallest 30% stocks, the R square of our uh, random forest model is 0.35%. And now after explaining the table structure, the first thing noticeable is that support vector machines tend to perform uh, consistently worse than, than the linear model, but also consistently worse than all other machine learning models. And one, one possible reason for this finding is that support vector machines are very, yeah, let, let's say vulnerable to the uh, choice of uh, hyperparameters or more, more vulnerable um, than all other models. But besides that, all other models um, tend to outperform the linear model on the full cross section in, in terms of uh, statistical performance. However, um, if we look at random forest specifically, we see that after dropping the, the smallest 10% stocks, which are mainly micro caps, let's say, um, the performance is pretty much on a, on a similar level. And um, this is, a, is an effect that we tend to call that uh, random forest is probably um, skimming small scale efficiencies, meaning that random forest um, tends to yeah, provide a better fit or, or seems to um, yeah, put more weight on, on small caps uh, or micro caps than the other models. On the other side, if we, on the other hand, if we look at gradient boosted regression trees and neural ne networks, um, they both show consistently better performance than the linear model. And even on the highest degree of market liquidity, they still have a, a positive um, R square, um, which, which is yeah, remarkable. Um, 
But besides that, in general, all models share yeah, a diminishing pattern in, in terms of uh, predictability along the several levels of market liquidity. Meaning that higher liquidity of the market comes with um, less predictability. Next, I will present um, the statistical performance for model combinations. And here we see that with exception of the first model, which is the combination of uh, the linear model and support vector machines, which performed pr pretty bad on the previous slide, um, all other models lead to an improvement over uh, the performance of, of the linear model. And besides that, we see if we look at the last three columns, where we have the combinations of only machine learning models, all models, and 50% machine learning models, and 50% uh, weight of the linear model, we see that with increasing weight of the linear model, the performance of the ensemble seems to uh, diminish or decrease. And uh, yeah, speaking of diminishing pattern, we have the same effect as on the previous slide, that with increasing um, market liquidity, we have um, less or lower predictive performance. <clears throat> Next, I will present um, the economic performance, as I mentioned earlier, uh, by first looking at at the aforementioned portfolio sorts for the full cross-section of stocks, meaning that we didn't drop any predictions uh, at, at this time. And as on, on the first table, I would like to somewhat yeah, guide you and along the rows, we can see the different portfolios. We can see the low portfolio where we assign those stocks that have the 10, those 10% 10 stocks that have the lowest predicted return for the next months. Then we have the high portfolio where we assign all stocks with the 10% um, highest predicted returns. And finally, we have the difference between, between the both, um, meaning high minus low. Um, on the, along the columns, we <clears throat> um, we have the several models that we established. Um, and moreover, we have several portfolio characteristics that go along with, with those um, 11 portfolios. Um, yeah, however, in our analysis, we are mainly interested in, in, in the average portfolio returns, which I highlighted. And as we see, all prediction-based sorts share the characteristic of yeah, increasing returns from, from the low to high portfolio, which indicates that every model is, yeah, or seems to have some predictive power in that sense. Um, and, and that is one property which is um, really de desirable. If, if we ha you have a predictive model. If we look at the return spreads, which ag again uh, indicate how well a model is able to capture the cross-sectional dispersion and returns, and by that providing a better measure of, of, uh, of model comparison, we see that all models are able to achieve statistically significant spreads and also that um, those spreads from machine learning models are higher than from the linear model. Those two bottom rows are pretty much statistical tests that um, yeah, assure that those values are significant. And um, yeah, on, on the next slide, I will show uh, the accumulated performance of the high portfolio which is this one. 
um, because that's what a real investor would most likely in, invest because as I mentioned earlier, um, very small stocks are yeah, costly and, uh, and sometimes or often not tradable at all. And as mentioned in, in this graph, we plotted the cumulative performance of every model's uh, high portfolio against the market, which was a European one. And um, in this case, the market acts like a yeah, proxy for a buy and hold, passive buy and hold strategy. And as you see, every model is able to outperform the market by a pretty large margin while at the same time, they seem to experience less severe drawdowns. Um, however, they generally follow pretty much the same pattern with the difference that gradient boosted trees and random forests, which are the both uh, top lines, seem to be superior in, in selecting stocks with uh, high future returns. Um, and now that we have benchmarked our models in, in absolute terms by benchmarking it to the market uh, using the high portfolios, I will continue on the next slide um, going back to the return spread because as I mentioned earlier, they provide a better measure of uh, metal, uh, model comparison. And uh, here we have the same table structure as before with the difference that um, now return spreads between high and low portfolios are shown. Um, and unlike for the R-square, now we see that uh, all models show performance gains over the linear model. So even support vector machines, which failed in terms of uh, st statistical performance, now generate uh, the highest spread for most stages of um, liquidity. And this is somewhat in line with uh, several findings um, from empirical research who found that statistical performance is only loosely, if uh, any, correlated with economic performance. And this is basically what we see here. Um, Lastly, oh yeah, and also we see a pretty remarkable spread on the lowest level of market liquidity, where a random forest excel with a spread of 64 basis points uh, per month. And this is pretty huge in, in terms of uh, uh, portfolio sorts. Um, however, as for the statistical performance, we again have this diminishing pattern with increasing market liquidity, but uh, machine learning models are still able on the, on the highest level of liquidity um, to generate a pretty high spread. This is still 20 basis points. And uh, also gradient boosted regression trees and neural networks uh, are on a higher level than the linear model. Only random forests seem to yeah, somewhat, somewhat fail to generalize that well. In terms of uh, model combinations, there, there is not a single combination that performs worse than the linear model alone at any time. So all spreads at all stages are higher than compared to the linear model alone. And this finding is noteworthy uh, in particular, since it implies that economic gains of the linear model can be leveled when we combine it with any of the machine learning models. Um, this is not the case if we reference uh, to each in individual machine learning model. So it, it doesn't work the other way around. And again, if we look at the last three columns here, we find that an increasing contribution of the linear model results in, in a worse performance of the combination overall. And uh, again, the combination of only machine learning models um, seems to show the best performance on most levels of market liquidity. 
coming to the conclusion and also looking back to the uh, contributions of our study, we provided an eye level compar comparison of the commonly applied linear model on the one hand and machine learning models on the other hand. And uh, we found that machine learning methods in general are able to uh, provide a yeah, better understanding of the cross section of returns, especially uh, if we, uh, in, in terms of return spreads or economic gains, if you want so. And uh, in terms of firm size or market liquidity, we found that uh, increasingly liquid markets are accompanied by diminishing pattern in, in diminishing patterns in predictability. And if I uh, referring to yesterday's presentation of um, David Streich, this is pretty much consistent, um, assuming higher market efficiency due to higher coverage on large stocks. Um, in, in terms of forecast combinations, we found that they provide the overall best and most robust performance, which is also in line with uh, findings provided by um, Timmerman. And uh, lastly, we used a non-US uh, data sample, thereby contributing to the reduction of US bias in, in empirical capital market research. But again, this is only one minor contribution of our study. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your time and feel free to ask questions.